Good afternoon. I'm Councilmember Adrian Adams, and I want to welcome all of you to this meeting of the Subcommittee on Landmarks, Public Site, and Dispositions. We're joined today by Councilmember Barron, and other committee members will be here shortly. Today, we will hold a public hearing and a vote on a proposed school site selection. We'll also hear five landmark designations, the rescission of a landmark designation, an HPD project, and a lease for a health and hospitals property in Staten Island. LU 615 was submitted pursuant to Section 1732 of the New York School Construction Authority Act. It concerns a proposed site selection for a new, approximately 322-seat primary school facility located at 6743rd Avenue in Brooklyn within Community School District 20, Community District 10, Council District 43. I now open the public hearing on this application. We're joined today by representatives of the School Construction Authority, and we have from SCA. Gail Mendino and Tamar Smith. Welcome. Before you begin, council will swear you in. Hi, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and answering all of council member questions? Yes, yes. I do. Thank you, you may begin. Good, uh, good afternoon, Chairperson Adams and Council Members. My name is Gail Mandaro. I am a Senior Director and Senior Attorney in the New York City School Construction Authority's Real Estate Services Department. Also with me today is my colleague Tamar Smith, a Community Relations Manager for the SCA. The New York City School Construction Authority has undertaken the site selection process for a new approximately 322-seat primary school facility on Block 5853, Lot 45 in the Borough of Brooklyn. The site contains a total of approximately 17,000 square feet of lot area, 0.39 acres, and is located on the corner of 3rd Avenue between 68th Street and Senator Street on the block bounded by Senator Street to the north, 68th Street to the south, Ridge Boulevard to the west, and 3rd Avenue to the east. The site is comprised of one privately owned lot in the Bay Ridge section of Brooklyn and is improved by a one-story with basement, medical diagnostic imaging center, and paved parking area. The site is located within Brooklyn Community District Number 10 and Community School District Number 20. Under the proposed project, the New York City School Construction Authority would acquire the site and construct a new approximately 322-seat primary school facility. The notice of filing for the site plan was published in the New York Post and the City Record on November 12, 2019, at which time the Community Education Council Number 20, Brooklyn Community Board Number 10, and City Planning Commission were also notified of the site plan. The CEC and Community Board were asked to hold public hearings on the proposed site plan. Brooklyn Community Board 10 held a public hearing on November 12, 2019. CEC 20 held a public hearing on January 8, 2020. Written comments were not received from the Community Board, CEC, or City Planning Commission. The SCA has considered all comments received on the proposed site plan and affirms the site plan pursuant to Section 1731 of the New York Public Authorities Law. In accordance with Section 1732 of the PAL, the SCA submitted the proposed site plan to the Mayor and City Council by letter dated February 10, 2020. We look forward to your subcommittee's favorable consideration of the proposed site plan and are prepared to answer any questions the committee may have. Thank you very much. Uh, we heard this application a little while ago and uh, Council Member Brandon is in support and whenever we see schools being built, that's always a good thing. That's what I always say, it's always a good thing. I don't believe we are ready to take our vote, Amy. Okay, we're going to continue our hearing, and uh, as we get our uh, quorum numbers, we will. Before we move on, is there anyone else here to testify in behalf of this application? Okay, seeing none, I do excuse the panel. Thank you very much. Okay, that portion of the hearing is now closed. We will now hear 
LUs 618 through 622, the designations of five historic row houses as five individual landmarks in Speaker Johnson's district, Manhattan Community District 5. The row houses are located at 47, 49, 51, 53, and 55 West 28th Street, Block 830, Lots 7, 8, 9, and 10, and 11. Around the turn of the 20th century, these buildings were the location of the most significant concentration of sheet music publishers in New York City. As publishers began to congregate in the area, the name Tin Pan Alley was coined coined around 1903 to evoke the racket of piano music audible on the block. I now open the public hearings on these five items. We're joined today by representatives of LPC. So we welcome Kate Lemus McHale and Timothy Fry. Before you begin, council will swear you in. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and in response to all council member questions? Thank you. You may begin. Good afternoon, Chair Adams and Council Members. I'm Kate Lemus McHale, Director of Research at the Landmarks Preservation Commission. Thank you for the opportunity to present these five landmarks designated in December 2019 associated with the significant history of Tin Pan Alley. Between 1893 and about 1910, the block of West 28th Street between Broadway and 6th Avenue was home to the most significant concentration of sheet music publishers in New York City. Here, composers, arrangers, lyricists, performers, and printers came together as collaborative firms, and from the cacophony of competing pianos within low-rise buildings lining the block, it became known as Tin Pan Alley. Do you want me to keep going without images, or wait a minute? Okay. Uh, Tin Pan Alley revolutionized the music industry's practices for the production and promotion of popular music. It, often cited, it is often cited as the birthplace of American popular music, making sheet music available to countless households for its role in popularizing ragtime as an American art form, and as the forebear of subsequent decades of popular music that came to be known as the Great American Songbook. The five designated buildings all house significant numbers of music publishers and related firms during the Tin Pan Alley period and have good integrity to that time period. They underwent lower floor conversions to accommodate two-story storefronts before or during the Tin Pan Alley era, and above those storefronts, they have undergone little change and retained much of their historic character. <clears throat> Among the landmarks, I'll quickly take you through, are 47 West 28th Street, built in 1852, and its current iron facade was installed in 1892 prior to the Tin Pan Alley era. It was home to at least 10 musicians and publishers' offices over the course of 11 years. It was also the office of the New York Clipper, which was the foremost music and entertainment magazine of its time. 49 West 28th Street was built in 1852, and its iron facade was installed in 1890. It was home to at least eight musicians and publishers' offices over the course of 12 years. 51 West 28th Street was built in 1852, and its lower floors were altered for commercial use in 1904 during the Tin Pan Alley era. It was home to at least 26 musicians and publishers' offices over 17 years. Both uh, 49 and 51 West 28th Street were the offices of M. Whitmark and Sons, who pioneered a number of Tin Pan Alley's marketing strategies and printed some of its biggest hits. 53 West 28th Street was built in 1859. Its lower floors were converted to retail use in 1889. And it was, next please, thank you. Uh, um, home of at least 19 musicians and publishers offices for 13 years. And finally, West uh, 55 West 28th Street, also built in 1859, um, was home to at least 10 musicians and publishers over 10 years. The buildings were calendared for a public hearing in the spring of 2019 following extensive research and analysis, conversations with preservation advocates and historians, and outreach meetings with the property owners. At the public hearing on April 30th, 
um, and in written testimony, the Commission received support for designation from 66 people and organizations, including representatives of Speaker of the Council Corey Johnson, Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, New York State Assemblymember Richard Gottfried, Historic Districts Council, the 29th Street Neighborhood Association, the New York Landmarks Conservancy, Municipal Art Society, Society for the Architecture of the City, Village Preservation, Save Chelsea, the Bedford Stuyvesant Society for Historic Preservation, Hamsong Foundation, the American Society of Composers, Authors, and Publishers, from Carnegie Hall, from the Museum of the City of New York, the National Music Publishers Association, Americana Music Productions, Audubon Park Alliance, Dumbo Neighborhood Alliance, Flower Tenants Association, Jujamson Theaters, Mabel Mercer Foundation, Musicians Foundation, and from 36 individuals, including descendants of James Reese Europe and J. Rosamond Johnson, African American compositions whose work was published on West 28th Street in the era, and descendants of composers and band leaders, Noble Cecil Jr. and Duke Ellington. Four people, including three representatives of the owner and one individual, spoke in opposition to the designation. This presentation addresses the history of Tin Pen Alley and the concerns that were raised in testimony and LPC's approach to these designations. Tin Pen Alley is shown in blue on this 1899 map in the midst of its sheet music publishing era. Built as brick and brownstone fronted row houses in the 1850s, the five landmarks found new lives as songwriters and sheet music publishers offices in the 1890s and early 1900s, when the area around Madison Square became the city's entertainment district. Theaters are shown here with stars, department stores and other entertainment venues clustered around the area north of Madison Square Park. And west of Broadway, um, West 28th Street was also in the heart of the Tenderloin, where high and low entertainment coexisted and where creative opportunities were available to a wider spectrum of the population than elsewhere. During the Tin Pen Alley era, music publishers consolidated for the first time as an industry on this block, where they could dispatch their sheet music to the venues nearby. The name Tin Pen Alley refers to the sonic experience of visiting the block around the turn of the 20th century. It was allegedly coined when a journalist visiting publisher Harry Von Tilzer complained that the clamor of these cheap pianos made the whole street sound like a Tin Pen Alley. Uh, local newspapers at the time often referred to West 28th Street, this block in particular, um, as the heart of Tin Pen Alley and where all of New York's best music publishers were located. Despite the later application of the name Tin Pen Alley to the entire music business, much like Hollywood is used to refer to the movie industry, the original Tin Pen Alley was built around sheet music at the turn of the 20th century. This was played by orchestras and on an increasing scale at home on pianos. As shown in this timeline of music technology, this was still the time before radio. Recorded music was prohibitively expensive of poor quality and only had a niche market outside the home. Tin Pen Alley represents then the height of the sheet music era, as the visit vivid covers that were printed on this block illustrate. During this era, a song's popularity was determined by how many copies of sheet music it sold, and publishers aimed to expose their music to as many prospective buyers as possible. Tin Pen Alley was an important cultural moment of intense music production and innovation. It produced such iconic songs as Take Me Out to the Ball Game, but was even more significant was the quick composition and massive publication of sheet music that made a long-term impact on popular music. To boost sales of sheet music, a number of influential industry practices originated on Tin Pen Alley, including hiring musicians to play songs in publishers' offices and as pluggers to demonstrate them in department stores and theaters, giving free professional copies to encourage orchestras, orchestras to perform new numbers, hiring what were called boomers to masquerade as audience members and demand certain songs be played, and writing songs about current events to score national hits. M. Whitmark and Sons, whose office was at 49 and 51st and 51 West 28th Street, um, invented a number of these practices. And the intimate scale of Tin Pen Alley's row houses made it convenient for music publishers to advertise their music to the theater crowds, 
allowed their music to be audible from the street, and also made the offices accessible to creative hopefuls easy, eager to capitalize on their talent. Tin Pen Alley represents important milestones for the participation of African American and Jewish artists in mainstream American music production. Ragtime music, originated by African American composers, is often considered the first distinctly American form of music, and Tin Pen Alley's ragtime publications are an essential component of its significance to American culture. A number of Tin Pen Alley's ragtime publications became well-known hits played in countless homes across the country and exported to Europe. The descendant firms of the first black-owned and black-operated music publishing businesses in the United States had offices on this block. And some of Tin Pen Alley's Jewish publishers printed ragtime music on behalf of black songwriters, in addition to adapting ragtime syncopation to create hits of their own. This period also has challenging history. Tin Pen Alley arose during and reflects a post-reconstruction context when racist policies, views, and ideology were prevalent in New York City and throughout the country, and among other injustices were reflected in offensive caricatures and stereotypes spread through mass media, including sheet music produced on Tin Pan Alley. As descendants of musical forms that were popular in minstrel shows, certain songs were built on racist caricatures of African Americans from decades of blackface performance. And some sheet music covers and lyrics published on Tin Pen Alley contained offensive epithets and slurs common in entertainment of the time. At the public hearing, representatives of the property owner raised concerns that designation would celebrate racist content and imagery of Tin Pen Alley sheet music. LPC also received a good deal of thoughtful testimony stating that shying away from this facet of a complicated history overlooks and delegitimatizes the participation of black artists in the production of this music with full awareness of the pros and cons and with a range of repercussions. To gloss over these aspects of history would be to overlook the experience of a significant portion of the population and for us a chance to miss um, to I miss a chance to communicate that these difficult histories are New York City and American histories, and potent reminders that the repercussions are still felt. Some of Tin Pen Alley's most notable composers were African American songwriters whose involvement in the Tin Pen Alley was a milestone and a means for them to reclaim the epithets and stereotypes used against them. J. Rosamond Johnson, shown here with Bob Cole, Burt Williams and George Walker, and Ernest Hogan, later reflected that some wanted to clean up the caricature, unquote, and made concerted efforts to produce sheet music which portrayed African American life without hurtful or offensive imagery, and presented formal images like these on sheet music covers. It is a priority of Chair Carroll to represent the diversity of New York City through our landmarks and to tell the story of all New Yorkers. LPC staff did extensive, rigorous research drawing from important scholarship insights and conversations with African American historians to better understand the historical and cultural context for this moment in the creation of widely accessible American popular music. These designations recognize the significant achievements of African American songwriters on Tin Pan Alley and acknowledge the adverse conditions that they faced at the turn of the 20th century. Between 1901 and 1920, most American households began to own record players for the first time and sheet music sales began to decline. By 1910, most of the music publishers on Tin Pan Alley had followed the entertainment district to Herald and Times Squares where larger, newer, and custom offices were able to accommodate their new in-house orchestras and recording spaces. This photograph shows the street as part of the city's flower district, which it was for many years. This image is from 1920, about a decade after the songwriters moved uptown. These five Italianate style row houses from the 1850s retain much of their historic character and represent Tin Pan Alley's remarkable concentration of musicians and sheet music publishers and its significant contributions to American culture. Together they preserve this history and a sense of the historic streetscape as it appeared when a musical cacophony was part of the experience of the block. 
The designation reports note and commissioners discussed on the record that the goal of this designation is to preserve the historic fabric of buildings that represent the significant history of Tin Pan Alley as part of New York City's cultural heritage so that we and future generations may experience and learn from them. I hope you will uphold the designations of 47, 49, 51, 53, and 55 West 28th Street buildings as individual landmarks. Thank you, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Kate, for your presentation. Uh, we've been joined by Council Members Ku and Miller. Before we take our vote, I am going to ask my colleagues if they have any questions for LPC. Okay, we have no questions. You are excused, thank you. thank you. We're going to go ahead and take our vote for land use for land use 615. Okay, council, please call the roll. Um, so for a vote for land use 615 three, for a 322 primary school in Brooklyn, um, Chair Adams. I vote aye. Uh, council Member Barron. I vote aye. Council Member Ku. I will aye. Council Member Miller. Aye. And Council Member Traeger. For school, I definitely vote aye. <laughs> By a vote of five in the affirmative, uh, no negatives, no abstentions, the items are recommended for approval by the full land use committee. Okay, thank you, Council. Members of the public wishing to testify, please come up. Mario Messina, George Calderaro, and Simon Simeon, I'm sorry, of course. Good afternoon. Okay, just a minute. You have to turn your microphone off. Okay. You may it. begin. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Adams. Thank you, Council Members. My name is Mario Messina from the 29th State Neighbor Association, and I'm here to speak on behalf of Team Panali. On the 26th of July, 2008, the Department of State published an article about American popular music. The article highlighted and directly linked many successful songs of Jewish and black musicians to Tim Panali. The Department of State and 66 others can name, I cannot name all of them because of the sake of time, who published books about the contribution of Tim Panali and the discovery and success of popular musics such as James Bland, the first commercially successful African-American songwriter in every Berlin, among many others, are facts that cannot be disputed. They created, indeed, national cultural treasures right in Tim Panali. Furthermore, the fact listed in American popular music from Main Strisley to MP3 by Larry Starr and Christopher Waterman and published by Oxford University are strong arguments that stress the important contribution made by those um, part of Tim Panali in the heydays. Let's not look at another positive effect of landmark preservation. Smart developers know that landmark preservation is a good business. Quality developers attract first-class business and tenants. Property value increases more in historic district than in normal properties, and it holds its value during economic downturns. We are all witnessing the incredible growth of Ladies Miles, Soho, Tribeca, mid Parking District, and Grand Central. Furthermore, your studies show that preservation creates more and important qualified jobs, increases property value, attracts heritage tourism, creates positive environment impact, and if, when I can turn the page, fosters positive social impact and promotes revitalization of the area. Grants for restoration are available for local historic preservation programs and grants. Federal historic preservation tax incentives programs has generated over 66 million in private investments and in rehabilitation of historic buildings since 1977. The 29th Street Association is planning to shepherd a project of creating museum of, of American popular music in Timpanali. And the working name for that right now is American Popular Music Project. 
This could help spark new life and keep the spotlight that it deserves on Team Panali. Thank you for your attention. Good afternoon, Chair Adams, Council Members. My name is George Calderaro. I'm Project Director of the Save Tin Pan Alley Initiative of the 29th Street Neighborhood Association. I'm urging your support of landmark designation of these five Tin Pan Alley buildings. For at least two decades, musicians, cultural historians, and preservationists have sought landmark designation for Tin Pan Alley, known globally as the birthplace of American popular music. Over the past several years, I've led the effort to finally protect this intact, irreplaceable piece of American and culture. As you heard, we've been grateful to receive endorsements from performers, and I won't enumerate all of them again, and they're in your report, uh, music organizations, cultural organizations, community representatives, including Community Board 5, and all elected officials, as well as the support of varied cultural and preservation organizations, and more than 20,000 members of the public who have signed our petition asking for landmark protection and, and uh, hearing. Among the most compelling testimonials we have received came from Robert Slayton, professor of American values and tradition at Chapman University, who cites Tin Pan Alley as one of two phenomena that made New York City the cultural capital of the country and the major proponent of American culture globally, and I'll quote if you forgive me, uh, before any other mass media, New York music became a national force influencing Americans in every region. With movies still in the their infancy and radio a distant dream, sheep music from Gotham introduced folk from all over our city's cultural and made us a top presence in the world in the arts, from Broadway to Peoria to San Diego and all points in between. With Tin Pan Alley, New York became American art for the very first time. If you had proposed this designation a century ago, the nation would have stood up and cheered a resounding affirmation. It makes sense to finally recognize this incredible contribution. I implore you to consider this and thousands of sincere requests over the obvious self-serving objections of the owner. Uh, designation is not intended to celebrate every individual song published during the era, but the birthplace of the business that gave us the sound of American popular music for the first half of the 20th century. To understand and learn from our history, we must confront even the most difficult aspects of our past and honor those who overcame and rose above it. Assuming that you'll affirm and your colleagues will affirm the designation, uh, I was impressed at the designation hearing that the, the commissioners were uh, interested in raising awareness of Tin Pan Alley and its legacy. And as Mario noted, we have already formed a committee, the Tin Pan Alley American Popular Music Project, to create a, a, an entertainment district. And we are hoping to engage the support of the council, the Economic Development Corporation, the mayor. Office of Media and Entertainment, NYC Go, and the Nightlife Com uh, Commissioner to create and revitalize uh, an American popular music district in, um, in Tin Pan Alley. Thank you again for your consideration. Thank you for your testimony. <clears throat> Good afternoon, council members. Simeon Bankoff, Historic Districts Council. I'm going to beg your indulgence because I'm going to go a little longer than I usually am. We've been working on this for a while. Thank you. You're kind. <laughs> um, HTC is the advocate for New York City's designated historic districts, landmarks, and, mer and buildings meriting preservation. We're delighted to support this designation by the Landmarks Preservation Commission, having been strong advocates for pres preserving Tin Pan Alley since 2008, when the buildings were then threatened with demolition to make way for a skyscraper. At the time, we were stunned by the remarkable international support our campaign elicited. We received calls and messages from Great Britain, Germany, and Australia wanting to help save the buildings where the American Songbook was born. We got to know musicians, artists, collectors, and historians from across the country, all of whom felt a deep connection with the site. It was truly unlike any preservation campaign we worked on. We mention this only to hint at the broad, meaningful public appeal this designation has. I've attached uh, an article from 2008 from the Sydney uh, Morning Tribune on that. Uh, I was wearing black back then, too. <laughs> Tin Pan Alley is more than this collection of buildings. It is a symbol of an earlier America. 
where the bounds of many seemingly where the bounds of unity seemingly reigned supreme because everybody was singing the same songs. This is, of course, a reductive and skewed image. The artists who wrote the songs, were, which were the soundtrack to America in the early years of the 20th century, were just as much outsiders as artists always are. They were African Americans trying to make their way in a culture that barely recognized them, but still was an improvement from the post-Reconstruction South. There are recent immigrants from Europe fleeing successive waves of war, economic hardship, and ingrained prejudice. Together, these groups of outsiders, working for colorful, aggressive publishers, transformed how music was shared and experienced in our country and around the world. The roots of popular culture can be found in Tin Pan Alley. The New York Clipper, which Kate had mentioned, an early sporting periodical, reinvented itself as a solely theatrical journal by 1894 and was located at 47 West 28th Street during the height of the music publishing era on the street. The Clipper later went on to become a small uh, newspaper known as Variety, by the way. Similarly, the renowned William Morris Agency was housed at 23 West 28th Street, uh, 43 West 28th Street, unfortunately not under consideration at this current time. But this is more than where music flourished. This is where the business of entertainment was born. It's sometimes difficult for people to understand what is being preserved when a landmark designation is proposed for sites of historic significance. People's uh, comments such as, these buildings have been altered, they look nothing like they did back then, or music isn't made there anymore, why do you want to serve these, miss the point. History is the communal memory of a shared culture. It depends on artifacts to transmit knowledge across time so that future generations can share in the same knowledge and form their own memories. The easiest form of transmitting knowledge are, of course, words, but they can also be the least impactful. Reading a fact about a place is nothing compared with the experience of visiting that place yourself. One's understanding of the actual events which happened in Tin Pan Alley, the jangle of dozens of pianos, the random encounter of artists as they would rush in and out of offices, jam together, the camaraderie and competition caused by such a close proximity, the hustle of the place, is so much easier to comprehend standing before these buildings. These buildings, with the appropriate learned knowledge, which I hope that uh, George and Mario's initiative will help uh, create, open up the early days of the 20th century in a way that even a great documentary can't. That they are still here today, uh, a century after their heyday, is a gift. To lose them at this point would be a tragedy. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Bancroft. As always, very extensive, uh, and you always, always paint a picture for us for these uh, for these proposals. I thank you all very much for your testimony today. I'm sure uh, that many of us will agree that Tin Pan Alley holds a history unlike any other in our city. So thank you very much. Thank you for the memories that you brought to us today for Tin Pan Alley to extend our view um, and appreciation. Thank you very much. Are there any more members of the public wishing to testify on these items? Seeing none, I now close this hearing and these applications will be laid over. We will now hear LU 623, an application for the receipt. Oh, before I go on, we were joined by Council Member Mark Traeger as well. We will now hear LU 623, an application for the rescission of the landmark designation for the former PS31 building located at 425 Grand Cor Concourse in Bronx Community District 1 in Chair Salamanca's district. The building had suffered structural problems and was damaged by Hurricane Sandy. It was demolished in 2013 per an emergency declaration by the Department of Buildings. In 2018, the Council approved a rezoning and Article 11 tax exemption to facilitate a new mixed-use development on the site of the former landmark. I now open the public hearing on this item. We're joined today by representatives of the LPC. Once again, we have Kate Lemos mikhail and Timothy Fry. You are still under oath, and you may begin. Thank you, Chair Adams. Uh, I am still Kate Lemus McHale, Director of Research at the Landmarks <clears throat> Preservation Commission, and I'm here to present the rescission of the landmark designation for PS31, which took place on December 10th, 2019. PS31 was located at 425 Grand Concourse in the Bronx and was designated an individual landmark in 1986. It was, des it was designed by Superintendent of Schools Charles B.J. Snyder and built in 1897 to 99. Um, to date, LPC has designated 26 schools designed by C.B.J. Snyder, including PS31, um, 21 of which are individual landmarks. In 2013, the Department of Buildings determined that the building posed a threat to public safety and issued an emergency declaration for full 
demolition. The image on the left is an aerial view of the vacant landmark site once occupied by the school. On the right is the former landmark site um, shown in red on the west side of Grand Concourse at East 144th Street. On December 17, 2013, the Landmarks Preservation Commission approved an advisory report on the demolition of PS31, acknowledging the Department of Buildings emergency declaration, the building's poor structural condition, and multiple efforts over many years to rehabilitate the structure. The building was demolished soon after. As was presented to the Landmarks Commission in 2013, serious issues were discovered <clears throat> after the designation, which led to multiple efforts by a variety of firms to rehabilitate the building. Because of its poor condition, however, the school was eventually vacated by 1997, and temporary shoring and bracing were installed. In 2012, after Superstorm Sandy, a damage assessment found that its condition had further deteriorated beyond repair as a result of the storm, um, including damage to the shoring and bracing. And this slide shows the building shortly after Superstorm Sandy. In 2013, as I mentioned, the Department of Buildings determined that the building posed a threat to public safety and issued the emergency declaration for full demolition. Um, at our recent public hearing on the rescission of the landmark site on December 10th, 2019, the Commission received testimony from a representative of the Historic Districts Council who did not support or oppose the rescission but urged better maintenance and upkeep of public buildings. The Commission voted to rescind the landmark designation because the designated school building has been demolished and nothing of architectural, historic, or cultural significance remains on the designated site. Uh, we recommend that you uphold this action, and I'm happy to take any questions. I'm just happy to see that something is going to be done on this site um, that will benefit uh, New Yorkers, uh, specifically after Superstorm Sandy. It's always good to see that we don't let these vacancies and these spaces just remain dormant um, and remain literally in ashes in our city. We've got so many other spaces to work with, so I'm really happy about this. I have no questions, but I did want to make that comment. So thank you for your testimony today. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public wishing to? <laughs> wishing to testify. Okay. Seeing none, I close this hearing and the application will be laid over. The next hearing is for LU 616, an application by the New York City Department of Housing, Preservation, and Development to facilitate the disposition and renovation of one city-owned six-story building located at 272 East 7th Street in Community District 3, Manhattan. HPD is seeking an Urban Development Action Area Project approval, or UDAP, and the approval of a new four-year tax exemption under Article 11 of the Private Housing Finance Law. The building, which entered city ownership through interim foreclosure in 1978, has 19 currently occupied residential units, which will be retained post-renovation. The property will be conveyed to UHAB HFDC for a nominal fee of $1. Post disposition, UHAB HDFC will come back to HPD to seek funding to coordinate a renovation of the property. At closing, the building will become a rent stabilized property, which rents set at 30% AMI for all tenants. Okay, from HPD, we have Lacey Tauber, Christine O'Connell, and is it Anya? Anya. Ani, Iron. Anya. Anya. Mm -hmm. Irons. From you have. From UHAB. Thank you. Before you begin, council will swear you in. Do you affirm to tell the truth and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and in answering all of the council members' questions? Yes. 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 Thank you. You may begin. Okay. Land use item number 616 consists of the proposed disposition of a city-owned multiple dwelling located at Block 376, Lot 28 in Manhattan Council District 2 
known as 272 East 7th Street. The project is slated for disposition through HPD's Property Disposition and Finance Program. Under this program, city-owned vacant and or occupied multifamily residential buildings may be purchased by a designated sponsor in order to create affordable rental housing units with a range of affordability. HPD has designated UHAB HGFC as an eligible sponsor for this project. 272 East 7th Street contains six stories and is comprised of 19 units with a mixture of unit types, including 14 studios and five two-bedroom apartments. The building is fully occupied and will be subject to rent stab stabilization upon conveyance. Initial rents for existing residents will be set at 30% of the area median income AMI. Estimated rents at 30% AMI are $425 for a studio and $662 for a two-bedroom. Upon vacancy, units will be rented at 50% of AMI and will be rented to families with household incomes at or below 60% of AMI. Once conveyed to the new owner, UHAB will coordinate the development of a rehabilitation scope of work with the tenants. LU616 also seeks approval of Article 11 tax benefits. In this case, the exemption period will be four years only, at which time UHAB will return to HPD for funds in order to implement the rehabilitation plan and an extension of tax benefits. Post rehabilitation, the property is expected to be converted to cooperative home ownership. The cumulative value of the tax benefit totals approximately $92,977, with a net present value of $79,445. And I'll just add that we also submitted for the record a letter and a tenant petition from the residents expressing their support for this plan. Okay, thank you very much. We do have support from uh, my colleague, Council Member Carlina Rivera, which I will read into the record. Dear Chair, Chair Adams and committee members, thank you for granting me the opportunity to speak in support of the proposed application for the Article 11 Tax Exemption and Urban Development Action Area Project, UDAP, for 19 units of housing in my district. By way of partnership with receiving entity, you have these individuals and families will remain in their homes under a rent-stabilized regime set at 30% AMI. A city-owned building since 1978, the site will seek public financing via Department of Housing Preservation and Development to then undergo much-needed capital improvements. As areas in the East Village continue to see upward pressures on rents due to real estate speculation, these housing units represent an opportunity for longtime residents to remain in a neighborhood that many of them have known for their entire lives. I ask that you join me in supporting this exemption and disposition to help preserve a place for these residents in their community. Thank you. I know that it's very important for my uh, colleague, Councilmember Rivera, um, that her constituents remain where they're comfortable. And uh, seeing no uh, opposition to this proposal, I thank you for your testimony today. You are excused. Thank you. Our last hearing is on LU 617, an application by the New York City Health and Hospitals for the approval of the leasing of approximately 24,080 square feet of land, including the 20,000 square feet administration building on the campus of New York City Health and Hospital Seaview. This approval, pursuant to Section 7387 of the HHC Act, would facilitate the 30-year lease with a 19-year renewal option of the city-owned property to Camelot of Staten Island Incorporated to operate a residential substance abuse use disorder program to treat women on the campus of New York City Health and Hospital Seaview. I now open the public hearing on this application. We are joined today by representatives of NYC Health and Hospitals, Matthew Levy, Jeremy Berman, Luke, is it Nusta? Luke Nesta from Camelot of Staten Island. Before you begin, counsel will swear you in. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and an answer to all of the council members' questions? Yes. Thank you very much. You may begin. Sorry about that. Good afternoon, members of NYC Council Subcommittee on Landmarks, Public Siting and Maritime Uses. New York City Health and Hospitals is requesting the approval for leasing of approximately 24,080 square feet of land, including 20,000 square feet administration building on the campus of New York City Health and Hospitals Seaview on Staten Island. 
The lease will be between New York City Health and Hospitals Corporation as landlord and Camelot of Staten Island Incorporated Camelot as tenant. <clears throat> Camelot will pay uh, health and hospitals an annual rent of $250,000 or $12.50 per square foot to be escalated by 2.5% per year for 50 years, with Camelot holding an option to extend such term for 10 additional years. The total rent payable over a uh, 50-year term will be uh, 24, $24 million, $24,371,087. Camelot... Ca Camelot is a not-for-profit formed in 1971, licensed under Article 32 of the New York uh, State mental, health, uh, mental Hygiene Law to operate outpatient and intensive rehabilitation, residential rehabilitation programs. Camelot operates two, intensi two intensive residential programs, one for adolescent males and one for uh, adult males. It also operates five outpatient programs, one on Staten Island and four outpatient clinics located in homes for the uh, homelessness, Tier 2 Family Shelters in Queens and the Bronx. Since 2012, Camelot has operated a 35-bed adult male residential program on the Seaview campus in the Camelot Rehabilitated Group Building. The proposed 25 Residential Substance Abuse Disorder program will treat women only because research indicates that gender responsive rehabilitation is more effective. Um, there uh, are no residential SUD programs for women on Staten Island. It will be housed in the now vacant administration building, which will be updated and renovated by Camelot with funding provided by the New York State Office of Alcohol and Substance Abuses to accommodate the potential uh, the patient population Camelot serves. The improvements made to the building will be at no cost to health and hospitals, but will further improve the dilapidated building on Seaview's campus. According to the New York State Department of Health, SUD is found on Staten Island at rates higher than the rest of New York City. Individuals with SUD represent approximately 33% of the Medicare beneficiaries on Staten Island, and 32% of these are hospitalized at least once each year, which is twice the rate of those without SUD, and roughly 30% of these are women. As previously mentioned, there are no residential treatments, pre treatment programs on Staten Island for women with SUD. Camelot maintains the acute detoxification services either alone or in combination with short-term 21-day 21, 21 inpatient rehabilitation is effective for less than 25% of the patients and ongoing outpatient treatment is also effective for only a limited percentage of patients. Thus, longer duration programs are necessary. Women entering the Camelot program will remain as long as nine months. The Camelot facility will accept referrals from health and hospitals and from a range of health and social services agencies on Staten Island, including members of the Staten Island Delivery System Reform Incentive PPS. Each Camelot patient will have a primary counselor and will receive treatment for SUD, including methadone, buprenorphine, base treatment, mental health issues, trauma-related experiences, and post-discharge planning with respect to employment and housing. Each resident will receive a medical and psychiatric evaluations and medications will be prescribed for chronic conditions. Camelot projects that 80% of its patients will achieve recovery. We look forward to a favorable review and approval of the lease agreement between Health and Hospitals and Camelot. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your testimony today. This is a very interesting application. Uh, just, just curious, a uh, couple of things. There are no residential SUDs for women on Staten Island at all, right? That's correct. Okay. Uh, and Camelot operates two residential programs, one for adolescent males and one for adult males. Was that, were those um, programs initiated in 71 or was it? No. Was the 24-bed you remember when that was open, John? 1990, oh, the 24-bed? Yeah, 92, right? Yes, 92. Okay, so the 24-bed was in 1992, and the Seaview operation was 2012. Staten Island is a little slow to accept its problems and its solutions. Okay, so, all right, so what I'm trying to understand. Sure is the uh, the obvious need for for this and, and just getting just background for my edification sure 
So there are no current for women only programs like this. The programs that currently exist on Staten Island, are they co-ed programs right now? Are they just non-existent? What does that look like? There are, there are outpatient programs that, that are co-ed, but there are no residential treatment programs for women exclusively. Okay. And uh, but the women are dying from overdoses on Staten Island at the rate of 25 a year. Uh, and there are about um, 300 overdoses a year of women. But o of those, only 25 are, are, are fatal. Interesting. Your locations in Queens and the Bronx, uh, where are they specifically? You're asking hard questions. Hannah. That's not hard at no, all. No, no, no. They're not, but I don't know the addresses. Okay. Do, does it, you, just, do you guys know the addresses of... Uh, not not really the addresses, just the towns. It's, I'm well, it's, Qu and, it's Queens and three in the Bronx. Okay. They're, they're, the sections, I'm just looking they're, they're for. They're located in, in, in uh, other programs that are run by others. They're co-located oh. with uh, Homes for the Homeless. Which, I see. Which operates tier two uh, shelters. I see. And so they're not uh, Camelot branded uh, programs. Camelot operates. They within. are not standalone Camelot programs. <coughs> right. They and are, they're, and they're not residential programs. So I think a big point, uh, if I can speak for my mm -hmm. colleague here from Camelot, is that this is a residential, long-term residential program. As as was stated there, the residents remain for as long as nine months. So that's an entirely different treatment approach than the outpatient approach, which is more episodic and uh, shorter term. Okay, thank you. That, that totally clarified uh, my understanding. Okay, uh, I think that was it for the questions. Is there anything else that you'd like to add? Well, I'll just say on behalf of Health and Hospitals, this is a positive thing for us because it takes a building that was previously dilapidated or is currently dilapidated and unused, and it um, brings use to the building. It brings state funds from OASIS um, administered through the dormitory authority of the state of New York, which will oversee the renovation. So it takes a burden off of us of um, minimal maintenance for an idle building. And I think the borough president is very interested in bringing more life to stat to uh, Seaview and seeing more health-related uses on the campus, complementary to the um, long-term uh, post-acute care facility that we operate. So this is um, in the general uh, uh, planning direction that health and hospitals would like to take the Seaview campus. It results in some modest income to the hospital and relieves us of the burden of this uh, dilapidated structure and serves important uh, community needs of Staten Island as, as Mr. Nesta has described. Thank you so much. I, I'm, I'm, I'm positive that uh, Borough President Otto um, would absolutely you know, love this uh, being a part of, of this particular campus, as would the countless numbers of women that would be able to take advantage of these services uh, and programs. So I thank you very much for your testimony today, and good luck thank with you. the application. Thank you so much. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public wishing to testify on this item? Seeing none, I now close this hearing, and the application will be laid over. I'd like to thank the members of the public, my colleagues, council, and land use staff for attending today's hearing. This meeting is hereby adjourned. <laughs>